Welcome to Ring Theory. During the Hobbit book and films, the dwarves take a leading role, with their central motivation for the story being their wish to reclaim their homeland under the Lonely Mountain. However, 60 odd years later, during the Lord of the Rings, they appear to not be taking an active role. Given that in The Hobbit the dwarves build a close bond with Bilbo, you'd think they'd be willing to lend a hand to help his nephew. It seems though, on first glance, that Gimli is the only one fighting against Sauron, helping the free peoples of Middle-earth. In this video, I'll be exploring what the heroes we met in The Hobbit were up to, and what the wider dwarven race was doing. Firstly, the dwarves we already know. Of course, if you are familiar with The Hobbit, you will know that a company of 13 dwarves led by Thorin Oakenshield arrives at Bag End, much to Bilbo's initial annoyance. And they embark with Gandalf on an adventure to slay Smaug the dragon and reclaim Erebor. Thorin, their leader, along with Thilly and Killy, were slain in the Battle of the Five Armies. A number of the other dwarves, Biffa, Bofa, Bomber, Dwalin, Gloin, Nori and Dori all continue to live in the reclaimed Lonely Mountain after the events of The Hobbit. They were under their new ruler, Dane Ironfoot, Thorin's heir. We actually see Gloin briefly in the main story as he comes to Rivendell to warn Bilbo that a ringwraith had come to Erebor asking questions about him and the Shire. After this quick visit though, he returned back to the Lonely Mountain. The remaining dwarves, Balin, Ori and Owen went on the expedition of dwarves to try and reclaim Moria. Owen was taken by the Watcher in the water before even entering Moria. Balin and Ori did at least make it inside, but were both killed by orcs. We see Balin's tomb in the Fellowship of the Ring, and see Gandalf reading the words written by Ori about the last stand that they made in the chamber of Mazabul. What isn't made clear in the films is the several fronts Sauron was waging war on in Middle-earth. His strategy was to prevent an alliance between all of the free peoples of Middle-earth, similar to the last alliance that defeated him at the end of the Second Age. He attacked the Elves of Mirkwood from Dol Guldur, manipulates Saruman into attacking Rohan and Helm's Deep, gets the Corsairs of Umbar to raid the Southern Gondor, and lastly, and most importantly, due to the focus of this video, launched attacks sending his armies of Easterlings to wage war on Dale and the Lonely Mountain. Legolas says in The Return of the King, I do not think that any would come. They have no need to ride to war. War already marches on their own lands. This quote is also inserted into the films, and if you've wondered what it's alluding to, it's this, the war that they were fighting against Sauron on their own lands. To give you an idea of the timeline, what's called the Battle of Dale in the Appendices occurs a few days after Theoden's death on Pelennor Fields and the fight for Minas Tirith. These wars were literally being fought simultaneously to the wars that our heroes that we know better were fighting. During the Battle of Dale, a character we know, King Dane Ironfoot, falls during this skirmish. As well as this, the grandson of Bard, who we know from The Hobbit, was known as King Brand at this time, leading the peoples of Dale. He was also killed in this battle. In general, the dwarves of Erebor and the men of Dale were not winning this fight. Not a huge amount of information is given, but we know they were pushed back into the Lonely Mountain in a defensive position and were being laid siege to. The tide only turned once news of Sauron's defeat filtered north. In essence, the dwarves were there, but as Legolas alludes to, Sauron's armies are literally on their doorstep. So to command forces to march halfway across Middle-earth in aid of Rohan or Gondor would have left them completely exposed. At this point, I also want to give a nod to the forward thinking of Gandalf the Grey. He persuades Thorin to attack Smaug and retake the Lonely Mountain all those years before in The Hobbit. But the main motivation wasn't to help the dwarves, it was tactical, to ensure that if Sauron re-emerged, he wouldn't be able to easily take the Lonely Mountain and use Smaug as a weapon. By the end of The Hobbit, the dwarves are back in Erebor, 
Dale was revitalised by their alliance, and Smaug was defeated. Without this incredible foresight by Gandalf, Sauron could have easily taken the north and been able to deploy overwhelming forces surrounding the free peoples of Middle-earth. Lastly, to give some more respect to the dwarves, they actually did fight in the Last Alliance that fought against Sauron at the end of the Second Age. Not all of them, many dwarven lords had become greedy with their rings of power, making them less sympathetic to those in need, but it's called the Last Alliance of Men and Elves, by the elves who seemingly choose to omit the dwarves from this momentous moment in history. Durin IV, King of Durin's folk at this time, sent an army of dwarves from khazad to fight in these wars. They did fight then, and they were fighting again against Sauron's evil in the Third Age, at the time of the War of the Ring. To say they didn't play their part is wrong, and they deserve more recognition from the fandom. Thanks for watching Ring Theory. On this channel, I'll be focusing on anything and everything to do with The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien lore from the books, the original trilogy, and the new TV show. If you liked the video and want to hear more, please drop me a like and hit the subscribe button below.